Bono has one. Costco has one. Emeril has one. And Piranesi had one. Formulas, like recipes, mix ingredients in predictable dollops, ensure predictable results, and generate whole families of DNA-linked variants. Today, you search for Eames on eBay. The program will digitally sort through its offering and served up a melange of mid-century sconces, dinerware, bric-a-brac, and lounges that subscribe to a design discipline which was extracted from what went on in the US during the 50s and 60s. Or you can try Beaux-Arts. It's the same. Architects and designers, it seems, are hungry for what used to be called pattern books, guides to what's in or out. Even the avant-garde has its hot buttons. What used to represent the pinnacle, say, Mies Seagram's building, so dominate the aspiration of architect up through the 80s that any angle other than a 90 was apostasy. And the formula which followed and which was no less religiously applied gave us wonders like Johnson Chippendale's inspired AT&T Tower, a genre in the arts can rapidly pr produce the equivalent of elevator music. It cuddles, never challenges, is safely contained, and it fills the space pleasantly enough. In fact, stepping outside of one personal formula, whether you are Richard Meyer or Patrick Schumacher, is risky. Look at Coca-Cola disaster with the silver can. Architects, more than most, seem to be bound by the expectations of the client, the codes, fabrication, design technology, and their own aspirations. But what if an architect looked to other models and base their work on the ephemerals, like aspiration, life size, and take a bit of risk. What about a practice that claimed no special allegiance to a, to a methodology, or even a predictable materiality? What would that architect's work look like? Well, maybe you're about to find out. Michel Rushkin was last a guest in this space about two years ago, where he shared the provocative work that he has been doing since his first love, not a woman, as a rock and roll drummer, but now you have many love, that your second love is your wife. And beginning his architecture practice in Mexico City, which he still is. He tells us that he has no formula, that he values the chaos, the risk, and the danger of that city, that he views each project as an opportunity to explore and to realize a new proposition. It is a constant search for him. Tonight, we will hear about the work that Michel has been doing since his last visit and share his ever-expanding repertoire with us. Please welcome Michel Roshkin.
Mm, thank you very much. Um, it's a pleasure to be here uh, again. <laughs> and uh, not only now to talk about work, but uh, to be here as a, as a teacher. No? It's very interesting to dialogue and to see what lies ahead for all of us, no? not only for the students, but for um, academy, for uh, professional life. Uh, so even sharing uh, a bit of the stuff here with all the colleagues is great. I'm going to talk about overstimulation. Uh, a couple of years ago, I talked about contagious risk. And I try to choose a theme that I relate to, even as a parent, when you think of sending your kids to uh, <laughs> to uh, stimulation, early stimulation school, and then you think, why do you want to early stimulate your kids? No, they're gonna be stimulated for the rest of their lives in so many different ways. But I think overstimulation is a good, uh, is a thing that you'll, you'll find interesting as well. The wonderful world of chaos and generation flux. I was bound up in a straitjacket, and McGulliver was strapped to a headrest with like wires running away from it. Then they clamped like lid locks on the eyes so that I could not shut them, no matter how hard I tried. The bankruptcy of the US investment bank Lehman Brothers. I've seen now what I've never seen before. Uh, George Simmel, a German sociologist in Metropolis and Mental Life, he talks, he says, the psychological foundation upon which the metropolitan individual, individuality is erected is the intensification of emotional life due to the swift and continuous shift of the external and internal stimuli. Man is a creature whose existence is dependent on differences. His mind is stimulated by the difference between present impressions and those which have preceded. Lasting impressions, the slightest in their differences, the habituated regularity of their course and the contrast between them consume, so to speak, less mental energy than rapid, than rapid telescoping of changing images. Pronounced differences within what is grasped at a single glance and the unexpectedness of violent stimuli. To the extent that the metropolis creates these psychological conditions with every crossing of the street, with the tempo of multiplicity of economics, occupational and social life, it creates, in the, it creates the sensory foundations of mental life and in the degree of awareness necessitates by our organizations as creatures dependent on differences. A deep contrast with the slower, more habitual, and more smoothly flowing rhythm of sensory mental phase of small town and rural existence. Thus the metropolitan type, which naturally takes on a thousand individual modifications, creates a protective organ for itself against the profound disruption within um, with which the fluctuations and discontinuities of the external milieu threaten it. Instead of reacting emotionally, the metropolitan type reacts primarily to rational manner, thus creating a mental predominance through the intensification of consciousness, which is then uh, cursed by it. What, I'm, what uh, he's, he's trying to intellectually say, or, or the idea about what is the, the stimuli, something that arouses or incites the activity. And this is what I started understanding. What do we see? What do we really, in all of this abundance of information, what do we really grasp? What, do we, what are we actually trying to focus on? And when I asked what do I see, I started understanding that I, I tried to figure in the projects that we had built, I was trying to think, uh, what I learned from that experience, and I was thinking about tectonics, for instance, I was thinking about public space and private spaces, I was thinking about fabrication process, how you, we were able to build things, how you were able to uh, not only build, but also understand who you were designing for, that it had to be something specifically made for the user on the other side of the table. Uh, I understood that we didn't want to specialize in any particular field also. And I wanted to grasp uh, these elements also. I understood architecture, uh, that it also not only served as a purpose of design or, or, or solving a functional space 
or um, this is a project for the Bicentennial Arch in Mexico. And uh, here's where I want to talk about architecture as a criticism or, or, or a critique on uh, our government in Mexico doing the Estela de Luz. Um, this was a project that, of course, we thought we were going to be uh, uh, thrown out of Mexico. Unfortunately, nothing happened. They just erased the texts, and, uh, and they thought it was like a futuristic toad. They, they, they uh, uh, wrote that on the paper. But um, we were talking about instead of doing something that does not work for the city, why not have social, um, uh, social dwelling? Why not extend public space? And why not do the things that a country needs instead of just uh, a symbol uh, to commemorate the bicentennial uh, festivities in Mexico? So architecture as criticism as well. Uh, also, architecture as opportunity. Uh, it is important and, and to understand that uh, by doing a certain amount of research, and this is the, the chocolate museum that we designed in Mexico that uh, I've shown before, but I come back to this because uh, the client never asked for a chocolate museum. But actually by having or seeing all this information around you and trying to really grasp important parts, even while the, the client is talking and telling you things, and you're actually trying to focus on all the things that are happening behind or, or between or whatever broad span you have. And um, uh, we did some research about uh, chocolate museums in Mexico and we uh, came back to the client telling him that there was no chocolate museum in Mexico. Uh, he was surprised, of, of course, we put, uh, made him see the economical aspect of it and we said, well, if you do a chocolate museum, you'll brand the company much better, but you're giving back something to the city. You're giving a cultural part. So. Uh, also about the idea of giving back. What can architecture do besides just solve a problem or a function, and if it can have another value to it. And this is the second part uh, of the lecture, where I talk about selection. Uh, how do we really make uh, or, uh, or select or do this selective sampling? And uh, here I'm going to talk a little bit about an uh, Estonian biologist, um, uh, Jacob von Wexkel. And uh, because he talks about the investigation into the animal environment and contemporary with both quantum physics and artistic avant-garde. And, and he talks about this, what is more stimulating, being in Times Square or being in the middle of the forest? So doesn't the stimulation depend on what we focus on, what th drives us, what thrives us? I mean, there's people that really get stimulated by reading a book. Some people don't. People depend on different things for stimulation. So he says, where classical science saw a single world that, comp that compromised within it all living species hierarchically, hier hier sorry for my, <laughs> hierarchically compromised, uh, I mean, order from the most elementary forms up to the higher organism, Wexkel instead supposes an infinite variety of perceptual worlds. That, though they are uncommunicating and reciprocally exclusive, are all equally perfect and linked together as if in a gigantic musical score. And actually what, uh, this is uh, something that he says, there does not exist a forest as an objectively fixed environment. There exists a forest to the park ranger, a forest for the hunter, a forest for the botanist, a forest for the nature lover, and a forest for the, ca the, the carpenter. So when we're talking about environments, uh, a closed unit in itself, which results from the selective sampling of a series of elements, a series of marks. Which marks do I choose to design? What are my drivers? How do I really put this every building, into perspective? Every building, every situation, a snapshot. I'm sitting here talking to you. I'm also checking the room, memorizing the people, what they're wearing. Then I ask the question, what's wrong with this picture? Do you think suspect? You gotta see it, assess it, and dismiss most of it without looking, without thinking. Without thinking. It's just like breathing. You breathe, don't you? Suit in the kitchen. Threat? Wait, how'd you see that? Guy in the gray sweater. Gray sweater, gray sweater, gray sweater. Don't forget what's right in front of you. Again, don't forget what's right in front of you. I came back to this movie because analyzing, uh, or this idea when you're sitting down with a client and how we bring it to architecture, uh, it's kind of being in a, and we talk, I talked about this with the students, no? it's like being in a boot camp, no? You have to be prepared for what's happening. And we're, we're living in a, in, in a time where nothing is predictable anymore. There's no, the future, I mean, is, is chaotic, no? It's like trying to predict the weather. There was a time where you could, no? And you could have a five-day prediction of the weather. Now you can't. You have to go out with an umbrella. You have to go out with a suntan lotion or whatever. But it becomes more complicated due to the fact that uh, we have to embrace instability. So when I was showing this clip, it was, again, the, the idea of when you're talking to clients, the client is speaking about a program. But is there something else be, uh, behind that? And I, I uh, talking with the... Uh, um, 
my partner Jerry at the office and talking with uh, some of the uh, people that we have working, um, we thought about this, no, ADD, Advanced Diagnostic Design. And, uh, and it's a little bit about like, uh, or trying to do a comparison. No? When somebody goes to the doctor and he, he comes to the doctor saying, can you give me an aspirin because I have a headache? So the doctor would, uh, of course, never give you an aspirin first. He will tell you to come in, have a checkup, and then he'll decide if he gives you an aspirin or not. But as architects, when the client comes up and gives you the program, he says, well, I want a house. And you say, well, okay, let, just let me do some research and let, let me do a diagnostic design or diagnose what you really need. In the case of Nest, uh, of the Chocolate Museum, uh, we would have never gotten a um, chocolate museum if we would not have done any research prior to that and come back to the client. So the idea of becoming more, uh, instead of designers, becoming a, 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 a more a, a important part to the client, that you are actually his advisor, that you can give him the best information or the best feedback, and he comes to you as a consultant, as a person who understands about the economics, the social aspects, the political aspects, geographical, and so on. And uh, this is a project that we worked in Mexico and uh, talking about the, the relating to the spy game uh, uh, clip that I showed. Uh, the driver for this project, it was a company in Mexico that's 160 years old. And they focus on, they, have the, they, they do department stores. So they do these anchor stores and shopping centers where you have one which is Liverpool and the other one which is Palacio de Hierro. And the idea uh, of these two being the anchor stores is that they all, they're always fighting to see who has the better store, who has the better marketing, who has the better whatever. And, um, and again, I come back to this image. This was the driver. When we, did the, when we started doing research or this diagnostic that I talk about, um, we found out that that was a good driver. If we kind of made them understand that they had to be better and how we can come up with a plan. Um, they were only asking us to do the facade. They already had an existing building. So we started working on the facade of the, of the project. We worked, um, this is 8,500 uh, stainless steel pieces, independent pieces. This is the first time we actually get to fabricate in the States. We digitally designed, but uh, fabricated it in Kansas City with the uh, Zahner metals. And uh, for, so from the 3D model, everything was fabricated, no 2D drawings. Uh, I think we ended up doing 2D drawings afterwards for the, to complete the set package. But, um, this is more or less where the building sits. It's already built. But we didn't stop there. And that, this is what I'm talking about, that when you really focus on everything that's behind uh, the client asking you for a specific commission, uh, if, you don't, if you're not aware of that, if you don't exercise your brain and your thoughts to really focus on, on what could happen uh, more, uh, we would have ended up with a single skin. No? And, but actually, we convinced the client due to the, the fact that uh, yeah, let me see if there's another image here. That there is no public space around it. This sits in a very, uh, uh, sub it's like a suburb inside a suburb inside another suburb in Mexico City. And he, as you see here, all these are gated communities. There's not, the sidewalk, I think it's 80 centimeters uh, width, so it's barely impossible to walk. So we, we told the client, what happens if you use the rooftop to put a park, because there is no public space. So all of these buildings with people living around can come up to, have a, uh, to sit on top of a park. Um, they enjoyed the idea, but of course we had to think of a complement uh, or, or an additional uh, uh, component, sorry. Uh, and we put the gastronomical area on top so they would eventually have uh, all their services, food and everything, instead of having the mechanical equipments on the rooftop. And they would go outside and then use the park uh, in, in a better way. When we convinced them to do this, and we didn't have, we, we were not obligated to do it, but we did it because we found out we could keep on going with the project. When we did this, uh, we got the commission to actually do the inner part of the building, uh, because then we uh, told the client about the importance of connecting the space. So we got to do the inner um, um, uh, light well of the, of, the, of the space connecting to the rooftop, and we created a, a dome also. So we enhanced the scope of work with the client to a second phase uh, of the project, designing the, the interior space, which is already finished. Uh, so one of the, what I'm saying, and, and one of the important things is, um, it seems to me like they want uh, to when we finished the project, people. not only uh, the client was they happy, uh, the store hours uh, that were from so 10 a.m. to 9 p.m., the park on top now closes at 2 a.m. in the morning because the restaurant is still Security open and they can't orange. get the people out. It's been on orange and um, uh, so it's changing their mind frame and we're actually working on two new projects with the client. Goddamn. Uh, 
Also, an interesting thing I think, uh, or I'd like to think of it as a generational uh, uh, thing, is that we recommended that the client work with different architects in Mexico. We recommended some other uh, colleagues so that they would eventually start having a catalog of different architects, not only uh, as maybe we would have done before. That no, I want to do all of the next uh, Liverpool's, and they're working now with Javier Sanchez, Enrique Norte, and uh, a couple of other friends in Mexico, which I think it talks good about a company understanding how to uh, uh, um, be dynamic in, in, in this world that we were talking about. So this is a video of the, it, it took nine months uh, for the project from design to build. And this is how we, uh, how it ended up uh, being on, on the side. No, it was confidential at the beginning. It was kind of this spy against spy thing. They made us cover the building with, uh, so the other guys from Palacio de Hierro would not see what we were doing, so it was kind of confidential for a long time, and um, which was crazy. It was like trying to cover a, an elephant with a blanket, no? But um, we ended up uh, unveiling the project, and it's uh, it's been really good uh, after that, no? the, the experience. Uh, another really great experience in coming down to digital design and local fabrication. Uh, this was really local fabrication because this is uh, some of the stuff that, that is very typical in Mexico City that you can get uh, a lot of the different really good craftsmen to do uh, steel pieces. And we designed um, a Japanese restaurant um, working with different uh, variations of the skin. And it was an existing house. We refurbished an existing house. But understanding also the budget, and this is kind of the extreme. No? On one hand, you had Liverpool that could pay a stainless steel facade in Kansas City and then on this other hand the, the client didn't want to pay well he didn't want to uh, uh, spend more money than, than the very minimum to do a, a, a good restaurant so we ended up CNC cutting really thin plate uh, we well I mean we did some boxes that are 10 centimeters wide uh, here you have some examples of um, we ended up having like 35 to 40 people welding on top of the building and um, we just, uh, a couple of months ago, we won uh, New York Best uh, Restaurant uh, with Interior Design. It was Best of the Year Award for the Japanese restaurant. Two levels and the idea of kind of breaking the box because it was an existing house that we kind of restructured and worked a little bit around it to open up the spaces. But we wanted the exterior to kind of uh, be more fluid in, um, in the sense of um, uh, creating a dialogue with the exterior part uh, and the, with the vertical gardens. Uh, this was a big team. Uh, I always talk about uh, we're a small office, but we kind of customize teams to work together. In this case, we work with uh, Robin Roland from Cocuya. We work with uh, Hector Esjawe uh, doing the furniture design. So everything was custom made for the client. Uh, everything was specifically um, tailored uh, because we also think that the, uh, by becoming this trusted advisor for the client or this consultant, uh, the client doesn't want to worry about all the different solutions. So we've found a way of getting into this part where we can convince the client to let us kind of take over and, 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 and give him the uh, turnkey project, no? uh, even with the graphic design. Uh, most of the, the glass walls hide in the back so it opens up and you have this fresh air coming inside the space with the um, with the shadows of the of the Brie de Soleil that covers the, the two layers. Uh, these are spaces that you suddenly discover on the inside that, um, again, we, we were doing the project, but when we started restructuring the house, we found out that we had a, a compressed space that didn't have, a, a, it would have stopped here, but uh, we got some permits to continue the space and enhance the, the double height of the space at the, at the back. This is called a tea room, and it's kind of a reinterpretation instead of going to the regular tatamis that you would go on top, here you would sit down with the sunken boots uh, specifically made for the site. Uh, and then the relationship, as I was explaining again, of the, the vertical gardens with, uh, with the mesh. Uh, another project we're working on, I'll show you two, two projects that are uh, on their way. This is a high rise that we're doing in, um, in Morelia that will eventually start breaking ground in, Jan in July. It's a 34-story uh, high-rise, and the idea started with a box that then we shaped it into a triangle, and then we exploded into three different parts to create a, a, an inner space. We decided also to, the idea that the inner space would be a vertical garden uh, in the middle, so the three towers have three independent cores. A little bit of this. This is where you get into the different uh, uh, lobby areas. But then once on top, when you go out of the elevators, everything is naturally ventilated. You can walk around, and then you have the, the 
the height all the way down to the building. And uh, again, some of the different things or the, the stuff that we discussed with the client was adding a, a public program in the middle of the tower. So there's a cultural center here with some uh, screening rooms. Uh, and instead of having like the typical uh, tower with uh, the typical amenities that you would go to a, a spa or a, the typical gym that, uh, that, that they would use, why not give the, the residents of this mixed use tower uh, uh, the, the opportunity to go to a screening room or have a, um, uh, a gallery space? Uh, we're working now, as I was saying on the project, to have uh, all the details and everything uh, uh, ready to go. Uh, the idea of the tower is uh, something that is coming out of, uh, of, na of the earth. We're trying to do some uh, precast concrete uh, with different tones of, of uh, um, so it, it resembles a little bit of earth-like materials, no? So instead of having um, a transparent tower, we're looking for the opposite, having some of the contrast of an opaque tower on the outside with an undefined edge, no? Ideally, like all the layerings. And then on the inside, you have the glass uh, element that will, will compose of the, uh, or will complement the, the, the fluidity and the, and the space. This is um, for Liverpool, the, the, the other company that we worked on, the, the stainless steel facade. And I think out of the frustration that we could not use the skin, because the stainless steel skin that we put on the facade of the building, it's, it's not, it, nothing happens behind it. I mean, there's service uh, paths. We managed to get the, the installations on the perimeter so uh, we could save a little money to spend on the facade. But we, it was a little bit of a frustration of not to really make it uh, inhabitable. So this next project that, again, they only called us to do a facade, which uh, now we're getting a third project where we're actually going to design the store completely. Um, uh, we proposed that they puncture, do some perforations on the, on the uh, brick wall, and then start having uh, different patterns. It's 240 meters in depth, but it actually becomes an inhabitable facade. So most of the program that's on, sin, uh, on the inside, you start walking on the outside. And we were trying to look for the idea of what made the space in the park become a space where people wanted to stay until 2 in the morning, uh, until 2 AM. And of course, it, you don't want to go to buy, uh, uh, I mean, to a store to buy and stay there for long. But if there's action, if there's activities, you do want to stay. So we were proposing that the sports area might have something that you could be doing uh, uh, Pilates outside, or you can sit down and have coffee, or you can walk around with the kids, or there's kids uh, playing. And this also changed the perception of, of, the, of the typical uh, exhibition gallery wall of a, of a department store, with the idea that you can communicate and it's, it's alive. It, there's no mannequins. It's not stiff. So uh, in a sarcastic way, a little bit like Mauricio Catalan, you're actually uh, uh, using, well, you're not using, but the people that will eventually go to the store and buy, they're, they're actually activating the facade the way they walk in and out of the building. So by having these, these connections to the spaces, uh, this is a little bit of, of, of what's happening. This is still in, under, uh, on process, and um, it will definitely happen uh, sometimes this, uh, sometime this year. We're uh, already doing the structural ideas, how to implement the structure to the existing building, and... Uh, where are they? You know, some exercises on the facades, I mean, on the, the mock-ups. And this is a project that already started a construction. This is Cineteca Nacional, the national, uh, Mexicans, Mexico's national uh, film uh, archive. And uh, it, it had some existing spaces already. It's been very popular. This is one of the places in Mexico where people talk about their cinema place or their uh, it belongs to them. It doesn't belong to uh, anybody else, but it's, it's for the people of Mexico. And by doing this diagnostic uh, research on the, on the project, uh, we were not asked to do uh, a park, but we showed the, the client uh, with, with some of these images that the actual image uh, or the actual public space of the, of the Cineteca was only this part when they had all this site with all the garden around it. So there was something wrong with that. And we said, well, of course, there's 50% of your plot is used by, by a parking lot. So what if we actually uh, enhance the, the green spaces no? um, by almost the double? What if we plant more trees? What if we take the parking, all of this, and put it in the front of the building so it now has a presence to uh, Cuauhtémoc Street, which has now outgrown, uh, or, or the city has grown a lot. Now there's a building here of 22-story 20, building. So everything became bigger now, and this only had like one level, so it was kind of difficult even to read how to enter the, the, the Cineteca. 
or the, the, the film. Uh, it also has an uh, archive. Every, every, all the Mexican uh, history of film is, is, is on these archives, and nobody knows about it. So the idea also to re uh, regenerate uh, uh, the, the, the film um, institute is that we also talk about the, the importance of the, everything that's there, we decided to put four new cinemas, uh, or that was part of the program, that then has a, um, a cover that f goes on top and creates a new access here because you have one entrance here and most of the people that come by subway, they arrive in the back street. Here you have a, uh, a cemetery which connects to a green space that we're gonna uh, do here with a, an exterior projection room uh, or an open cinema. So there's two main access that will eventually connect the building. So we added four new cinemas, we added a parking lot, we added more vaults for the, for the archives, and we added a public space. And again, if we wouldn't have uh, worked on the project, we would have not even uh, thought of doing a public space because uh, we would only have followed the instructions of the client. This is a little bit of what's happening. They wanted to create a cover, but we said, well, why don't we do a cover that's a bit, uh, that lets the light in, and it's a reflective white material, so the idea is that when you come in, you have another screen that projects people walking underneath. So it's, it's kind of another layering of the people watching, coming to the cinema. And then you have the ramps going up um, uh, to the, the four new spaces, and it starts creating a dialogue with the existing building. This is the existing building that, that we have there. Um, this is the opening where the, uh, the Consuelo Sizer, who's the cultural ambassador in Mexico City, she presented the project, and now it became uh, a political priority. Now it's uh, our president wants to uh, open up the, the space before he leaves term, so that makes the project a, another instant project that has to be done by November. No? Um, this is a little, uh, an animation, so you can see a little bit of... And I always joke also about this, that in Mexico, the only time you know when a project is real is because it's urgent that you finish the construction. No? So you never have enough time to do projects. Um, um, as I said, we already started doing the foundation of, the, of this area. Some ramps that take you to the upper part. Of course, a lot of things changed now in the, the construction documents. This is uh, Rio Churubusco, and this is Cuauhtémoc Street, and this is the cemetery that will eventually, as I was explaining, connect to the open-air uh, cinema. With the weather conditions that we have in Mexico, it was really interesting also to propose an outdoor experience. Maybe we'll even get, uh, there's an experience here in Los Angeles that uh, you go to see or watch movies at a cemetery, you know? It's been happening for a, a while now. We don't know if we'll connect it to the cemetery to project there, but... I use it as an example that it would be great to really connect some way. The open air cinema. And as I was saying, it's, it's, it's supposed to be, uh, we'll be there to make sure that we finish in November. So again, uh, each of us has a different reaction to the different stimuli. I don't know what stimulates you, but I'm trying to figure out what stimulates me. And this is, this is more or less the job that we're trying to do at the office, no? And uh, we're not talking about sensitivity romantically speaking. No? It's about what we choose to, that, uh, that calls our attention. So it's not about you're more sensible than I am. And it's not about this uh, conversation that I've had with friends of, um, uh, for a while that uh, if it's better to be multitasker or not multitasker, to go in depth or to not go in depth, I think the important thing is that you're able to react to any condition. It doesn't matter how much goes in, but it's the importance of what you let out that to me starts making sense. And this is uh, the last chapter where I talk about adaptation. I think we're, uh, we need to turn on the survival mode. We need to activate survival mode in a sense that we have to embrace instability. Coming from Mexico, the, a place where it's very chaotic, it's never, I mean, people talk about crisis, we've always been in crisis. Mexico has been a place where you always learn to adapt. 
And even if you know how to do a thing once, eventually somebody from the government will change or some private investor will do things differently and you need to learn it again. So this idea of getting frustrated or mad about things not, or that you cannot learn something that you will reapply, I think we're in a time where you really need to be dynamic and flexible. This idea about adaptation. And, uh, and just, I mean, uh, uh, quoting again, uh, uh, another great uh, uh, philosopher, Sloterdijk, uh, a specific uh, design task, the reintroduction of perception to the user and visible features of the project. And this is not only how we see it, but what we're able to tell the client in, in the case for, uh, for this project. This is for Nestle, and, uh, another project that we did. So is it an innovation lab or is it a public pavilion? Is this a skin or a park? Sorry. <laughs> is this a museum or a public back of house? Because when we won this competition, we managed to plant the seed inside the head of the, of the client to convince him that it was great to have a public back of house. So this idea about, about abstracting uh, this overstimulation and what you're able to even tell them to make them uh, uh, understand the project and, and what's the, uh, the bigger intention or the best intention of the project, and then suddenly it's the idea of the client. Suddenly he's all over the project for the, the specific reason. Uh, I also show this because at some point, and, and I, I showed this the last time, but this is another company that we, that we created out of this unstable future. We, dis we decided to do a company called Agent that focuses on industrial design. And we designed a soccer ball. Um, a soccer ball that has no air, but has a GPS system on the inside. It won the Red Dot Award. It's going to be exhibited in Milan uh, for this year. Uh, now, finally, because when I presented it two years ago or a year and a half ago or some, uh, FIFA didn't want technology. Now they want technology, so now we're in discussions to see if we can get it produced. But the idea of going to smaller scale things and bigger scale things, but even understanding what are the possibilities and thinking uh, who's going to be the next one to say what's next, no? So why can't we start thinking of if there could be cameras in the, in the different um, uh, parts of the soccer ball where you can have actual footage taking from the ball with the scanners that will now, of course, the technology is still in process, but in the future, you would eventually could have the point of view of the soccer ball. Uh, we also created a luggage for contemporary travelers. We designed stuff thinking about who's a new traveler, no? Is it a single parent? Uh, so the idea that you have a kid that can jump on top of the, of the, of the luggage or single mothers or instead of renting a trolley or, or buying it, I mean, using it for $4, and, I mean, you could use the same one to put the luggage in. Or even for uh, people that want, if you want to sit down in your own luggage. But then it's again questioning if design should be one direction or should, be, should it go in different directions? Can we start uh, doing hybrids of things that not only uh, work in one way so they can adapt and they can become multiple things? Um, and so it's not that, I mean, of course we know Charles Darwin's theory, you know, but it's not the strongest of the species that survives nor the most intelligent. It's the ones that most adapt to change. Uh, I don't have some images that I wanted to show, but there was, I wanted to bring in some species. And I, w I was going to talk about um, a koala that learned to adapt to eat uh, eucalyptus leaves, no? but it's talked about that if uh, the eucalyptus tree dies, or there, there's, I mean, or um, uh, there, there will be no more. It's complicated that the koala will adapt. And in the case of a monkey, that they're now, uh, when you see monkeys in cities, they eat everything and they're adapting to everything. They can eat chips, they can eat whatever, and they're learning to adapt. Um, uh, so this idea of adaptability and being uh, ready for, <laughs> uh, you never know what's gonna happen next, you know? And, uh, and the age of flux that I, I feel part of this, um, uh, they're calling it now the flux generation, no? but it, uh, it says the age of flux will be defined more by fluidity than by any new settled paradigm. If there's one consistent pattern, is that there is no pattern. So I really believe that we have to stop uh, 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 questioning how we're going to uh, reach stability again, but find different solutions that really drive us. Not wait for, uh, we've all known how uh, social media is changing a lot of things, how power is changing hands dramatically and quickly. So we don't know what's going to be the next thing, but we need to be prepared. And the only thing we can do is be prepared for that. 
And I will close with this image. It's the only one that I could find, but, uh, and it's a, uh, uh, I was thinking when, when you're kids and the first time you go out with your girlfriend and you kind of kiss a little bit and you f uh, fondle a little bit, and then there was this expression that I didn't understand, and sorry if it's a really bad word, but you get, <laughs> the expression is blue balls, and I didn't understand what that was. <laughs> and I said, well, that doesn't, ha doesn't that happen to your brain? If you get all this stimulation and you can't get it out, don't you get a blue brain? And, uh, so you must find a way to let it all out. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>